I wanted to to ask. I understand that this will be difficult for you to ask, and we we will ask it of the MND in due course. But we want to understand two sides of the same coin, as it was. So as it were. So what I was looking to understand is why this drug, uh, in your view, collectively has not been used properly in line with the um, very clear user guidelines that have been set out by the manufacturer. And why you think, I mean, um, Dr. Croft, you, you said the MOD have been hostile in, in terms of dealing with the effects associated with this drug. Why you think that may be? Obviously, we will ask this of the MOD and try and understand why they're, they're like that. But what is your view? What is the underlying? There must be a reason why this drug continues to be used even though the very clear empirical evidence um, that you have presented this morning um, would indicate otherwise. And if I could start with you, Dr. Cobb. Well, uh, a simple answer is that for a while there have been legal actions against the MOD, and then the, the MOD will dig its heels in when there's a legal challenge. So that, that is one reason why they might take that position. Um, one has to ask what kind of advice the MOD has been taking. They've been advised by the Surgeon General, of course, but the Surgeon General is advised by external advisers, and they may be influenced improperly by Roche. I know of one particular advisor who advises them, who does have uh, links with that company. I wrote about that in the British Medical Journal in on the 24th of April, 1999. Sorry, just saying, the advice yes. the Surgeon General receives on this, yes. he is advised at times by an individual who also yes. advises the drug manufacturer in this case. Yes. The Surgeon General obviously can't be knowledgeable about all areas of medicine. Yeah, so he relies, on advisors. he relies on advisors. So he's never actually said that, but the reality yeah. is he must he yeah. must take advice. Yeah. And one of his advisors yes. works for the drug company. One of the advisors to the military over a long period of time doesn't work for the drug company, but uh, it's known that he has strong financial links or has had in the past with Roche, and this is documented. And I've in fact reported that in the British Medical Journal. And he still says and what he's was an the advisor. reaction? Because that's quite yes. a serious yes. um, yeah. Yeah. allegation. What was the reaction to that in the British Medical Journal? He didn't, he didn't respond. Yeah. No, no. In fact, I was, quoting, I was quoting his own words where he didn't, in a previous paper, okay. they said, I've received research funds from Roche. And he was, at that time, I was commenting on an article he'd written which was advocating the use of methylene. Yeah. And I said, well, the problem with this article is that some of the authors have conflicts of interest which are not declaring. Yeah. Okay. Now, that, that advisor, and there may be others, yeah. had links to, links to Roche, which is a big company with all sorts of um, research interests and the ability to confer patronage, direct and in indirect. Um, so that, that could be a problem. This could be partly why the Ministry of Defence has this entrenched position, because of the advice they're giving, they've you, been given. You don't think it relies on any science? Uh, they're, they're, certainly, they're, they're, their position is, is to some extent based on science, but um, it may be based on, should we say, biased interpretations of science. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, it could be cost. Um, there's over, say, a six-week period, a calculation on retail prices. Larium is about £25. Yeah. Uh, doxycycline, sort of 30 to 54 And malarine is 288 Okay. So you think cost is a factor. What, what about you, Dr. Nevin? Yeah, I can speak to the U.S. experience. Of yeah. course, uh, the U.S. military developed uh, methylquine and then recruited uh, Roche as its commercial partner to uh, market the drug. And it is, I think, worthy of some note that the U.S. military uh, has declared the drug it developed to now be uh, a drug of last resort. And U.S. Army Special Operations Command, which arguably has the most experience with this drug, going back even before it was licensed, uh, has taken the very wise step of banning it uh, altogether. Uh, the U.S. military took these uh, steps, I think, based on uh, the totality of evidence before it. It was presented with unequivocal evidence that it could not prescribe the drug safely in accordance with the product documentation, but also uh, the guidance of a number of military authors writing in the CDC's uh, yellow book, the travel guide, for example, stating that the psychiatric side effects of uh, mefloquin can confound or complicate the diagnosis and management of post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury, which makes the continued routine use of mefloquin less desirable. I think that the box warning, the continued media attention, and the fact that service members simply were not taking the drug uh, altogether uh, led to the wise decision of the U.S. military to uh, deprioritize its use. And what about you, Colonel Murray? 
I think this is a multifaceted problem. It, it, it's one of the issues that I've been trying to extract from the MOD for many years. I've, I've actually tried internally while I was serving, and then after I retired, to go through what I thought would be internal processes that would be able to help people identify what the problem was <coughs> and then address it. Um, I've, I've had a great deal of difficulty in, in, in pursuing all of those routes. I think that to give the MOD credit, when the drug was initially introduced in the 1990s, it was for very good reasons and in order to overcome the problem of, of malaria. But as we progressed through the next decade, and certainly during the time that I was serving, um, it was clear that there were problems with the drug. And the way in which it was being administered um, was a problem. And I think it has been partly hubris, um, a difficulty in recognising a problem and grasping the nettle at an early stage, a series of vested interests in people who have been advising the Surgeon General and the Surgeon General then saying that he is simply taking advice from Public Health England, has created a situation where there's no end of problems and no one, either in the formal chain of command, from the Chief of Defence Staff downwards, from the Surgeon General downwards, has been prepared to recognise that there is a problem and are persisting with it. And I suspect probably in the hope that they'll be able to quietly stop dispensing this drug over the next year or so. And if they do so, then they can perhaps avoid perhaps a massive bar-wave of litigation that may be behind this because of the both individual and institutional neglect and incompetence that has been surrounding this issue for eight to ten years in my experience. Okay, thank you. Um, um, just John for a second. Um, before you leave that point, can I just ask Dr. Nevin, when the US changed its policy and said this is now going to be used only as a last resort, was there then uh, a bow wave of litigation in America? Ah, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. The U.S. military may be somewhat uh, unique uh, in this regard in that uh, the U.S. government is protected uh, from uh, civil claims uh, by something called the Ferris uh, Doctrine, a Supreme Court decision uh, from many decades ago bars service members from suing the U.S. government uh, for injuries uh, sustained during uh, military service, even if, if due to gross uh, negligence or incompetence. And so service members are not able to uh, seek uh, damages uh, for injuries due to uh, mefloquine. I believe the reasoning of the Supreme Court in making this decision many decades ago was that there is a system in place, the Veterans Administration, the military disability system, to provide for uh, care of individuals who may have been injured uh, in this uh, manner. So it's possible the U.S. military was free to make decisions about the use of mefloquine unconstrained or unconcerned about uh, possible legal uh, ramifications. That's very helpful. Johnny, sorry to interrupt you. Sorry, no, not at all. That, I, I think that's really interesting in how the, the overall wraparound <coughs> care perhaps, perhaps forces individuals to look out, look out for themselves and go after some sort of civil case. Um, j just finally, um, my, my worry, which interestingly none of you have mentioned, is that all drugs have side effects clearly, and that, that, that is mentioned time again by both the manufacturer and the MOD, and that, that's totally accepted. But my worry is that because these are mental health side effects, that um, we still, for some reason, have a problem with destigmatizing in this country, not only across society but in the military as well. My worry is that because they are mental health side effects, they are not taken anywhere near as seriously as physical health side effects. Mm -hmm. And actually, these have built up, and the, the body of evidence is stacked up, to even to a study last year which indicated in the Royal Navy of, of those who took it, 54% were affected by methylopathy. But again, because it's mental health, they're not being picked up. Is that um, a, f a fair assessment? Or um, do you think it, 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 goes, um, it goes beyond that? Yes, if, if I may, a uh, very fair assessment. It, it is unfortunate that psychiatric effects of anti-malarial drugs are not studied as carefully uh, in a prospective uh, manner as our physical 
side effects. Uh, psychiatric side effects, by definition, cannot be detected, they cannot be observed, they cannot be measured, they require the subject, the patient, to report the presence of symptoms. And we know time and again that the populations that these drugs are tested on, the populations that these drugs are used in, there are many disincentives or barriers to reporting these symptoms. And so there is a systematic bias against assessing, properly assessing, the incidence and prevalence of psychiatric side effects uh, from antimalarial drugs, particularly in military settings, but also when used, for example, in developing nations for treatment of malaria. It's a very serious problem, and I hope that uh, the attention uh, being given to this issue among veterans will help to inform improvements in anti-malarial uh, drug development in the future. Yeah, and I think it, it's just worth saying at this stage that the, the committee absolutely accepts that some people have had their lives decimated by this. The fact that it's a mental health problem for us is irrelevant. It's, it's, it's a, a physical problem uh, um, that we are, you know, that's why we are spending so, so much time here. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you. Might, might, might I add yes, something? Because I think it's I think it's important regarding the data that are available to the Ministry of Defence. Um, I'd like just to refer to the situation of um, Major Cameron Quinn, who you probably all know committed suicide, um, and his widow, Dr. Quinn, received. Um, at the behest of the Chief of General Staff, a reassurance of one of the various protocols that are supposed to be monitoring the use of this drug. And that states that um, all military medical practitioners are required to report adverse reactions to Larium to the MHRA. Now, that also appears in various military policy documents. So it's, it's not discretionary. And actually, when Dr. Nicol was um, presenting her evidence, you saying that in the civilian world, yes, it is discretionary, and it's something between the patient and the doctor. Um, I read that um, around about 2007-8 with a degree of surprise, because I had passed through at least five military medical practitioners, and not one of them had mentioned the yellow card reporting system to me. So I checked with the MHRA to see whether or not a yellow card had been raised on, on, on my behalf, and the MHRA were unable to find one. And I followed up then with another query to say, can you give me an indication over the past decade how many adverse reactions have been reported by uh, the Ministry of Defence? And I think over the period of about a decade, it was something like 10. Now, I have personally come across multiples of them within, within one year. And this is, part of, this is part of the issue that, for various reasons, these things are not being picked up and reported. And there have been other incidences of medical personnel um, in Sierra Leone who have seen people who have got what appear to be very bad reactions to larium and for various reasons have not been reporting them. Um, now it happened not just during my tour, but in a subsequent tour, which actually destroyed the marriage and life of, of the family who are sitting behind me. Now, these all relate to the issues that, that you were addressing. Why is the MOD not addressing them? Well, the more we look at this, unfortunately, the darker it becomes. And what I would hope is that we do, it's really sorry to have to for, for me to have to expose these in, in public. I mean, it's something that is inimical to me. I've had 35 years of, of what I believe to be loyal service, and I don't like to have to expose these problems within the Ministry of Defence. Um, but they need to be gripped, because soldiers' lives are at risk, and also the lives and welfare of many of the families who are subsequently affected. Yeah, absolutely, Sorry. and that's, that's precisely why, why the committee is doing 